Future Hacker. Life. Path. Future. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Future Hacker. I'm your host, Maria Taigi, and today I'm talking to Sasha Beslik, a true trailblazer in the world of sustainable investing. Sasha's work has been instrumental in driving the growth of ESG investing, not just in Europe, but globally. He's a renowned thought leader and practitioner in this space, having launched the pioneering Stars Funds with Nordea in 2011, which was recognized as Sweden's outstanding equity fund in 2017. Sasha was awarded a medal from His Majesty the Queen of Sweden for outstanding contribution to the environment and sustainability, and he was recognized as a young global leader at the World Economic Forum back in 2011. Currently, Sasha sits on various boards and global committees, and is also a board member of the Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change. He's the author of the book, Where the Money Grows, and produces an influential weekly podcast on ESG investing called ESG on a Sunday, which he just told me he's like growing like crazy, has about uh, 30,000 subscribers, right, Sasha? And he's growing like at a really great rate. And we do hope it, it keeps growing because it's amazing, amazing content. We are so honored to have him on our show today. We can't wait to hear his insights on the future of sustainable investing. Hi, Sasha. How are you doing today? Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be uh, here and to talk to you in Brazil. I have uh, very good uh, experiences and a lot of warmth in my heart for Brazil in so many ways. Uh, so many good memories, so many things that are important that are happening in Brazil. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. It's a real, real honor. And you know what? We're doing something different today, Sasha, as we have this special guest that was interviewed by our Brazilian channel, Luciana Lana. Luciana is a talented lawyer and environmental consultant with an entrepreneurial background with a specialization in business law. She has just completed the course to become a board member at IBGC. And she's also a great communicator. She has been a key contributor to ESG community in Brazil. So she started translating Sasha's newsletter, ESG on a Sunday, to make his thought-provoking articles accessible to the Brazilian public, which is amazing. We're thrilled to have her on the show as well. And I can't wait to hear these insights. That's for sure going to be such a great conversation. Luciana, thank you so much for introducing us to Sasha, for being here with us once again. And, you know, I'll hand it over to you so you can kick off our conversation today. Okay, I think it's it's like a pleasure for me. I mean, as you all know, I'm very emotional right now <laughs> because, you know, Sasha, I'm your biggest fan for sure. So, Maria, thank you so much for enabling this talk. And I have to take this opportunity to thank Sasha twice for his kindness in sharing his time and knowledge with us today and also for allowing me to translate his wonderful newsletter Yes, John Sunday into Portuguese. This experience has been extremely valuable to me, a true tool to look at sustainability issues in a more critical and questioning way. So, Sasha, Maria kindly agree for me to start this podcast with the first question. So, you have this interesting journey of changing your career path from a traditional banker focused on making money to becoming a passionate advocate for responsible investing. Can you tell us about a specific moment or experience that motivated you to shift your career focus from traditional banking to responsible investing? Thank you very much, Luciana, and thanks for, for making this happen for me in Brazil. I mean, look, I started my career as a war correspondent and journalist, so it's many years back. So I did a lot of reporting from Africa and from some other places, and then uh, eventually I ended up in a finance business, in asset management business. And uh, in, in the sort of a one, one specific moment that I really remember was when I was standing in Africa, I was doing a project in, in Africa for a World Bank on the social impact assessment in Zambia. And I was called by a recruitment agency in Sweden to offer me a job uh, in asset management firm in Stockholm. And I was looking at the African plains in, in Congo. You know, it's, it's a beautiful scenery. And I was thinking, well, do I really want to change this and go to work in a, with a finance in the office, you know, in, a, in a Stockholm or London or whatever. But then I realized something, and this was the, 
experienced that sort of a change and transformed my life. I realized that in the world that we live in, you have a lot of, you know, different sort of a fractions of power in the systems that are integrated in sort of interacting with each other. And the money system is a very important system. We all know that. And I was thinking for a split of a second, imagine if we could just shift the money flows in a bit different way and do it just a little bit different. We don't need to sort of do big revolutions. We just shift the way how it's done. And that was the transformative thing for me. So it's changed my way of looking at how you can use financial industry. Financial industry is a toolbox. It's, it's a toolbox. You use a toolbox to produce, you know, to invest in guns and weapons and oil and gas and all of these other things. And then you can use things, use financial toolbox to invest in hospitals and medicine and energy solutions and different things. So, so, and I wanted to do this, the other thing. So that's the reason why I'm here. I absolutely love that, Sasha, because at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's unavoidable, right? If we want to really make a change, if we want to really make impact, we have to go to the pockets, right? Or also, and I do like your approach that it, it could be like this, this minor, this minor change in course and not really uh, something completely new, right? You say that the, currently the financial system is completely flawed. And, and so we are, we are going to get into that later. But before I go into the next question, you, you, you say that it's flawed, but it, you just mentioned that, you know, it's just like a change in course. So how do you see that? You see the change in course, it's, it's all about, sometimes you also have to understand what you don't need to do. So it's the things you don't need to do. So what we don't mm -hmm. need to do is that to completely sort of a dismantle the system. What we need to do is say, okay, it is actually functioning, but what it produces, it's not really good. So, okay, if it's functioning, can we just shift it away? Can we try to find a way how we can use the system that works to produce other outcomes, better outcomes for society, better outcomes for environment? So my thinking is always to try to uh, be innovative in a way how we can shift the things. We don't necessarily need to redo, invent the warm water again. We already know what it is. Can we just shift the way how it works? And I think, you know, the, the system is people. When you talk about financial system, it's not just numbers processes, Bloomberg, mm. terminals, it's actually people behind decisions. So it's about us. It's us as an individuals, as a groups that we make decisions. We make choices. We have a choice. We make choice every day. And I want people to make choices that are a bit more long-term choices than the short-term choices. It's not easy yes. because we as a humans are very short-sighted. So it's, it's, it's the way, the, the, the other way of thinking, think about it like a, like a, like a financial yoga. You know, to think about the other way of, of doing the, you know, the, the things that you usually do. So following that rationale, so it's all about people and, and the choices we make. You say that investors have this responsibility to consider the impact of their investments on society and the environment. Um, still, I uh, find it very challenging to access, uh, to have access to accurate information about what companies are really doing behind the curtains. As much as the market is starting to create barriers and punishing greenwashing, the way ESG is measured is still flawed when guaranteeing companies are really investing in making this positive impact. So what are some practical steps that you know, we as individuals could take to research and evaluate companies' ESG performance beyond simply relying on ESG ratings or reports? I think your question is so relevant. This is so important question because it points at what the problem is. The problem is that you have the companies that will do a lot of reporting and, you know, whitewashing what they do. And then on the other hand, when you look at the way how they operate, it will be completely different. So one of the things that I, I used to give a, a lot of these speeches and, and tip to people what, what to do, it's like, don't forget about the ESG, ESG ratings that don't give you anything because they are done on, in the format that companies can actually try to find a way to navigate around the tricky questions. What you need to understand a couple of things. One is that, okay, how does the company connect its sustainability strategy to its products and services? Just look at that, ask them, so how big percentage of your products are truly sustainable? And can you show me example of that? That's question number one. Question number two, if you look at the financial 
numbers of the company, any Brazilian company, they will give you a, um, a numbers on how much they plan to grow their business or how much they plan to grow the segments of the business, market share, uh, you know, market penetration in different terms, uh, sales of certain type of products. Then you ask them a question. So show me your financial numbers and then show me how does these uh, are these financial numbers supported by your ESG strategy, your sustainability strategy. And usually, unfortunately, and this is, Maria, what I need to sort of tell to people that will listen to this, is that these two things are not correlated, which means that we are living in a society right now globally where the businesses are still operating on a business as usual sort of a terminology. Sustainability as a concept is accepted, but more as a reporting exercise, not as the key business exercise. And this is the, this is the challenge because we cannot change, shift the capital flows if this is just a reporting thing, you know, nice report, glossy report and all of it. Who in Brazil goes when you buy a product, when you buy whatever you buy, who goes into a corporate website and look at their CSR report? Nobody does that. So what you want to have is the information on the product. You want to have a product where it says, okay, this is how this product is sustainable. This is how it's linked to the growth, the value of the business. This is how the CEO is incentivized to actually do this. So how big percentage of the of the bonuses or revenues of the company are linked to this to, to sustainability? These things, parameters are very important. I absolutely love the idea. It just seems to me that we are so far from that. And uh, Luciana, uh, please go ahead. You're muted. Just go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, just 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 to make here a uh, uh, connection. Uh, in, in, uh, in terms of governance, as we were in the BGC course, uh, is to escalate environment issues in the business strategy. That's the, big, the biggest problem that I see when I talk with clients is to take these issues as social and environmental issues and put it into another level, into the business strategy. That's the really difficulty that I see here. You know, it's to move this from a checklist, then stop being a checklist and going to the higher level. But the, Please, Sasha, go yeah, ahead. Look, there is and the reason why it's complicated just to take you to another level on this. So the capitalism basically is based on on uh, on the growth model where there are no borders. There are no no limits. So you can grow business as much as you want. But of course, everybody knows it's it's like biking without not knowing that, you know, you cannot bike. So. There are limits and the limits are basically the way how the system works is that 10% of the world population is outsourcing the cost of living to the 90%. So, and that's basically what is happening all the time. And we call this market economy capitalism. But the problem in capitalism is that externalities like water, forests, all of that is not priced, but it's used. It's used every day, but it's not priced. So that any, any damage of environment in Brazil or any other places around the world is outsourced to the taxpayers. So you will pay the damage, you know, through increased taxes. But what we need to do is that we need to start looking at the companies from the perspective of how, how we can price the externalities they are dependent on, you know, because the companies are using externalities as a free thing. So how can we change that? And this is the, what Luciana is saying. How can we get them to understand this? And the way we get them to understand this is to say that I don't care about what you do on your reporting. I want to know, tell me about your product. Tell me about your service. I want to know exactly how that is sustainable. That's the shift we need to make. And that's basically the pressure from, 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 from the clients and the customers, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's pressure from the clients, regulators in Europe. You know, you have a regulation in Europe, which is the, the only regulation in the world with a, with the EU taxonomy and su sustainable finance disclosure regulations. They are basically the sisters. So they are sort of supporting each other. US is doing the new sort of a disclosure regulation. Japan, where I work now, will also have some kind of a thing. So. Things are moving, but we are not fast. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, Sasha, you introduced this unique approach to evaluating companies based on the environmental, social and government's performance. Uh, you called it inverted ESG analysis, right? So can you explain to our listeners what's this approach about and how it differs from traditional ESG analysis? Yeah, inverted ESG analysis is all about looking at if, if you if you look at the company and you say 
you come from the outside and you say to a company, you know, uh, <clears throat> your carbon emissions are important, how you treat your employees is important, how diversity is important in your governance. And they say, maybe, I don't know exactly, maybe this, and as Luciana said, how can we value this? So what I did is I reverted it and I said, okay, what of these things are not important for your business? What, how can we sort of trickle this down into what is really important? And then you realize, <clears throat> when you do this inverted analysis, then you realize that companies are truly dependent on many environmental social issues to, to, repo- to, to produce their products and services, but they are usually not valuating them from financial perspective. And this disconnect is a very dangerous disconnect because ESG, future of ESG, will fall or survive based on this. And what we see now... It's happening in the U.S. with the Silicon Valley Bank and Signature and all of these things. It's all governance related. So all of this has a link to ESG. It makes completely sense. But, you know, when, when, when thinking about um, practically, right, I feel that companies are already struggling so much with all the different metrics around traditional ESG and Honestly, and this I think Luciana could even tell me more, um, better about it. I'm, I'm not sure yet if they are really struggling that much or if they're more focused on, on just checking, you know, making the checklist for, for whichever reports they need to, to, to do. Like, but, you know, it's okay. How can this new approach be used to engage companies and encourage them to adopt more responsible business practice? So I'd like to hear that from Sasha, but I love also to hear Luciana's point of view because, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, you know, Luciana, uh, before we interviewed, we, we, we met at IBGC, right, Luciana? And we introduced me also to another wonderful person, Onara. And both of them were interviewed by the Brazilian channel. We even created this ESG real life group, right, Lu? Because, you know, we got into this conversation about what, what is really happening and, you know, what, what they're really seeing out there being directly involved on the business within the corporate world. So, and by hearing the ESG real life, you know, compared to what you're learning out there. So it's already hard as is today. So first, Sasha, you know, how do you see company actually being able to engage on that? And then Luciana, your point of view of what you're seeing out there here in Brazil. Maybe Luciana can start because I've been speaking for about <laughs> 20 minutes, so it's good for her to jump into the conversation. Yeah. Let's go, Lou. Oh my God, that's a challenge question. <laughs> uh, I think we're a little bit uh, delay here. It's, we, it's not happening uh, in the velocity that we need. I think the, the big issue is that uh, we have to understand that sustainability is just like Sasha said, is internal, internalizing is externality, is externalities. Oh, that's a lot of big words. And this will not always represent investment and return, but cost. Uh, in the end of the day, sustainability is cost. It, because people want, okay, but what do I gain with ESG if I invest on ESG agenda here in my company? I listen to that all the time. What is the, what's the, uh, the profitable, uh, a path to do that there's sometimes you're not going to have return this investment but it's like it's what the capital is saying it's what the market is saying you have to be sustainable and that's a very difficult thing because uh in the end of the day the the, the core the moral core of a company is the profit and it's okay it's in the law the companies they are here to do money to make money but how do you make this the money, the path, no? So that's very, uh, that's a, a really challenge here today because we are not uh, developing this as in the in the velocity that we need to do. So it's, here in Brazil, we are very, in little steps, you know, I, I, that's my feeling. But it's not, I mean, and, and I hear what Luciana is saying, it's not only Brazil, I think you have even in the developed part of the, if you think about the developed ESG countries like France or Netherlands or Sweden and so on, it's the same struggle. And the struggle is about the fact that if you look at the corporate charters, you know what the corporate charter is, the one that defines the, the responsibility of the board and the CEO, what the company is to, to produce. Basically, it's in the Brazilian law. So as Luciana said, there is a law basically stipulating what the responsibility of the companies is and the CEO at the board. These charters have not changed the content for the last hundred years. 
So it's the same thing it was before. The world has changed. So environmental responsibility of the company needs to be part of the corporate charter. So the CEOs and the boards can have that as a part of responsibilities they have. I was a CEO for investment funds in Sweden for Nordea. And I, when I signed my contract, I asked my board in my contract, there was nothing about environmental, social and governance risk, nothing about ethics, morals and everything. And they looked at me and said, you mad? The, you know, this is not about, this is business. Okay, but business is part of society. Society is a part of the region. Region is a part of the continent. Continent is a part of the planet. So it's all connected. But I think some of these things we need to change. And I don't think we will get this fundamental shift until, unless we look at the way how the capitalism is structured. And it's structured through laws. So we need to change the law system. Yes, our our company, our corporation law here in Brazil is from 1967. So, so it's it has, I mean, it's not, yeah, yeah it's not, res, yeah. I mean, the one that I think that I looked last time in Sweden, I think there are some modules that have changed, but the sa it's the same thing from 1800 something. It hasn't changed. It's the same thing, but the world has changed and the role the companies have, they are global players. Before they were in 1967, most of the companies in Brazil, they were very local. Now you have Brazilian companies, they are global. So how is that reflected in the law? And these are the things that regulators have not done. So politicians are not doing really helping us to do this uh, because we need help to get the, these laws to change and adapt. So going back to, to, to your inverted ESG rationale, Sasha. So let me know if I, let me see if I understood correctly. Uh, Maria, so basically, Ma Ma Maria, I'm so sorry, uh, but just to, to finish. Yes, it. please, please. Uh, so Sasha, do you think that ESG agenda and all these sustainability issues will take off with regulation, through regulation? I think if I, if I look at Europe as an example, if you look at how the, this new taxonomy which is not complete. I mean, taxonomy is in Europe is not it's not perfect in any way, but it's better than anything, any, nothing, you know. And then on the back of taxonomy, you have this sustainable financial disclosure regulation, which is financial regulation. I think it is creating a pressure. So I think regulation is creating a pressure. Without regulation, you don't have a reference point. So you don't know exactly where to go. When you have a regulation, even if it's not perfect, you have something to sort of uh, see, okay, how can we develop regulation now? How can we move in that space? <coughs> and we have liabilities, so yeah, yeah. risk. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, you know, from a, from a risk perspective, what Maria was about to ask, I mean, if you look at what many Brazilian, and I, I have invested in Brazilian companies many years ago, we actually had, when I was working for ABN AMRO in, in, in Netherlands, we had a Brazilian ESG fund. This is many years ago. This is 2007 and eight. And uh, we were investing in some Brazilian companies. I met with some Brazilian companies. For instance, I was probably the first investor that ever visited Natura, which is the Brazilian cosmetics, you know, and I went to see their factories in a, in a forest and, you know, all of these things. This is 2007, this is a long time ago. And, and uh, I remember that the interesting thing for me at that time and now is not, and I'm going back to that, show me the product. Show me how much are you doing sustainability on your product level. Forget the reports, forget the GRI, forget the TCFT, forget all of that. Focus on their business. And if CEO cannot tell you, or CFO cannot tell you, next year we're going to grow 12% 12, 12 or 10%. And in relation to climate targets, our financial calculation on this will be this and this and this. That's where you want to come. That's what you want to see. I absolutely love that, Sasha, and 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 this is something that for sure it's 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 just I feel like it's just inserting another chip on people's brains, you know, because I think uh, uh, we usually are more used to complain about whatever is all around us, right? So companies are not doing enough, governments are not doing enough, and 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 very few of us get actually to practice that in our own lives. And you're going way far from not only practicing that, you know, just the basics, right? Recycling and things like that, but actually going to the companies that you most love, that are most close to your heart and understand, so how does this product that I, that I like to consume is actually how, what are the plans? Like, what are the plans to make it more sustainable? What are the plans to make it more viable? What are the plans to, right? And, and, 
And then go, going back to the rationale, so you say that to start this whole um, analysis within the company, let's begin by what you're not doing, what does not make yes. sense to us, because there's yes. so much yes. out it's there. Yes, it's like I call it a noise. And then you can yes. get to the exactly. core. Yes, that, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Then you get to the core, like, okay, that's so this is what makes sense. This is what. But if you start, if you start on a personal right. level, so it's more like a personal thing. Think about it in a philosophical way. So you start with your, if you are to leave your place tomorrow, you know, just leave to walk out mm -hmm. in Brazil, you walk out of your apartment. What are the things you don't need? What are the things you don't need to have with you? What are the things you don't need in your life? There are a lot of things that we do, which is with your, which I call it's a, it's a jittery noise. It's a noise, things that not necessarily make any sense. And most of the business people in the companies in Brazil, around the world, they know exactly what is important for, to run their business. So what you want to have is discussion when you talk to them. You don't want to have a discussion about, you know, animal rights policy or uh, KPI XYZ from GRI, which makes no sense. What you want to talk to them about is, okay, these three things are important for your business. How do you make this sustainable? That's the that's the discussion you want to have because the rest is just doesn't matter because it's, they're not going to do it. Thank you. No, just to, uh, another connection here because um, uh, Brazil has a more urgent environment problem, which is the solid waste and sanitation. And, if, and for me, it's much more uh, important problem than climate change. Okay, um, and here we have a beautiful recycling credit market, but companies find it's more, I don't know, maybe, I'm sorry the word, but glamorous to invest only in cover market that we know for sure that's not 100% real, reliable. So the, I think that's a, a little bit uh, connects what, with what you're saying. No, but I think you have a, you, and this is this leads us into another sort of a discussion, which I think is very important discussion. The ESG global agenda, sort of a, the, the global ESG space is dominated by Anglo-Saxon narrative. What I'm saying is that it's dominated by US, not, not US so much, UK actually, much more, and European sort of a Western way of thinking. What is happening in Latin America, what is happening in Africa, in Asia, Southeast Asia, nobody cares. So, because the ESG is also used to discriminate many markets, saying that, you know, we believe carbon is most important because it will save my life in a Western world. It will make my life easier. That's why I think all Brazilian companies need to, you know, clean their record. And we have forests. Yeah, yeah, I know, we have I know, I know. I know. Here. <laughs> I know, I know. I've been there. I know, I know how it looks. But I also think this is what you, Luciana is saying is very important, is that that you will have the future of ESG is local, regional, it's not global. So it needs to be break, broken down where it makes sense. So if you look at Latin America, there are so many regional issues that needs to have much more attention than the climate carbon market thing, because you already are on the right side of the sort of a threshold, on the carbon threshold. You're not using, we, it's us, we are consuming your credits. We are consuming for our, for our non-sustainable life. So I think the future needs to be like you have a Latin American ESG framework, you know, where you're focusing on addressing the Latin American ESG issues, not connected to what UK investors think it's important or French or Swedish, you know, and this is what needs to happen. I absolutely love that. Lou, the point that, 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 that you mentioned is so important and uh, which brings this localization, this making it local from, from uh, that Sasha said. Because I was having this conversation with another guest and, and he told me the following, like, you know, the, the, and we know that already, right? So the, the money is not where it's supposed to be. So you have, when you, you talk about developed countries, uh, rich countries, they're going to have challenges that, you know, that's, that's the reason they are going through carbon and things like that. So when it comes to investing in sustainability, uh, the challenges are way higher when it comes to developing countries, as Luciana mentioned. We have so many other wishes and so basic ones, right? Uh, so we like resources, infrastructure, governance, regulatory framework, as you're talking about, Sasha, political instability, adding to that, not only the interest, but the instability. So what steps can government and private sectors, investors take to overcome those barriers when promoting the sustainable 
economic development in this market. So how can we bring uh, the maybe the rich countries actually investing in developing countries that at the end that the ones that they're on the heart of 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 you know pollution and 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 and, and we are providing like you know m many of the developing countries are the one having the fabrics and providing and providing the other countries and lacking the resources to making it right, to doing it right, right? So how can we ensure that investments in sustainability benefit also as well the local communities and promote the social and environmental justice at the end? You know, I think th this, is a, this is a big question that you're asking. It's probably the one that is hardest to sort of give you a very short answer on, but I can try to do one thing. And is to say that if I was a Brazilian government uh, with, with the resources that Brazilian government have in terms of the rainforest and, and carbon sort of, a, you know, all, entire sort of a carbon coverage for the rest of the world, I would price that in a way that, that it benefits Brazil. And I would take money from the, the rich countries to, to be able to do, to, to be able to compensate in a completely different way and, and to, you know, develop completely different mechanisms to, to price this. Because I think the price me mechanism is important because the price mechanism is also indicating that something has a value in capitalism. If it doesn't have a price, it doesn't have a value. So nobody's going to give you money for that. So I think that's the one thing. The, the second thing is that, you know, I think that that uh, the best way of, of getting rich countries to invest in a real solution in developing countries is to tell them these are the things we actually need. And these are the things that we actually need to change instead of saying that, oh, but you need a carbon credits. We give you a half of the Amazon. So you put the price tag on it and then you take the carbons and then the people in Brazil are not able to use these, this, this carbon. They are not able to develop their life. It's called colonialism again. And it's completely crazy that this is happening. And I think the next big sort of, uh, how you call it, the bomb, the, the world sort of a financial bomb will be about carbon credits. Because the carbon credits will implode, they are given in they are, they are done in so many different ways. Nobody actually knows track them. Nobody knows how much carbon are we compensating, what is compensated, what is not compensated. There is no track system for that. So it's just uh, it's 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 very very risky. Yeah. And I have to tell you, the local population from the forest. They are not sympathetic to the projects. They hate actually the projects. They are extremely hostile because they know that they are not going to be able to work the land again in the way they were used to do. So it, it's a very a, a big issue here. I have a lot of clients that invest on carbon projects, so I need to address this kind of problem in uh, Amazon uh, uh, bioma. So it's very difficult. But it's all, it's also because I mean, Luciana, that's probably we, we touched upon this. It's because it's coming from one angle just one angle it's not looking at the local context of what does it mean for local regional context in brazil and this needs to change we need to change this it's and you know the reason the way, one way of doing it is absolutely absolutely so let's talk a little about the future right so this is what we have today so what changes it doesn't need to be that far away because you know we, we it's it, it's changing fast you know as much as there's so much you know, things that are not done properly today, we see a lot of changes really fast, right? So what changes do you anticipate in the financial industry in the coming years uh, when it comes to, you know, the, the ESG and making a positive impact? And how do you think we can create a more equitable and sustainable financial system? And adding to that, do you, and um, a personal question, do you, do you, do you find yourself an optimistic about the future more cynical, more pessimistic regarding things that you're seeing today? You know, realists are usually called pessimists because they are not positive. <laughs> but, but you know, I, I'm always, look, I wouldn't be doing this if I'm not a positive somewhere optimist that I think that I believe in humans. That's probably my biggest sort of a, how you call it, uh, a challenge, a curse and a blessing because I believe in humans. I believe that we as a human race can change. We can change the way of thinking. We can help each other. And all of this is about changing the perception, but changing our minds, how we actually view this. So, you know, if I look at the future, I think that you will have, as I said before in our conversation, you will have more regional solutions for ESG. You will have much more, you know, 
like Latin America, key focus on ESG issues and key results related to that. I think you will see probably because of Europe, uh, you will see more regulation in other places. Now, how that regulation is going to look like, I don't know. But given that, that Brazil has uh, the, the commercial partners both in Europe, US and, and Asia, I think Brazil will have to find its own sort of a place in this. Uh, giving you a new government, I think it's going to be more focused on environmental issues and social issues going forward. So I think it's you will probably see a, a faster, in some way, faster track on this. But still, as Luciana said, the businesses need to uh, shift their gears as well. They need to shift the way how they do business. And as long as you don't change the regulation, you won't see this because regulation is unfortunately, I have to say that I, I don't necessarily think we should always use regulation. But regulation in this case, it's actually a good thing because it pushes companies. It puts the sort of a benchmark saying, oh, this is right, this is wrong. And there's a gray zone between. But, but we, you know, I, I think regulation is needed because we need that push. We need a push in that direction. Yes. And so if you can, uh, I, mean, I mean, I think it's a, one important message for me was like, first, we need to update our laws and the regulation. That's very clear. So that when I, we talk about ESG on a public sector, maybe we need to be, do better than we are doing now. And because, uh, in, unfortunately, uh, public sector doesn't have governance, so that or has has a little, so it's more difficult, uh, especially because of the transparency issue. Uh, and we have to go beyond the Anglo-Saxon yeah. vision of sustainability. I think that's the. <laughs> That's very thank important. You, thank that, you for that. that. That's thank a very important you for that. Message. And when you say that the solution uh, they are on local, uh, regional, it's I, I I remember this book. Yes. I don't know if you, if you already read from. Yeah, he says that. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yes. Solutions, look, all sustainable solutions that we need, systemic solutions, they need to start on a local level. You cannot do the bottom, you cannot do a top-down implementation of that. It needs to come from below and from the people that are affected because, you know, we don't even ask these people, you know, indigenous people living in, in Brazil or living in Indonesia, we don't ask them, what's your advice to us? We think we have all the best solutions. We don't. We don't know. And because that's they why, live so uh, close to nature, you know. Here, it's a... It's, uh... That's why the global governance uh, of the conference of the parts, the COP, as COPs, uh, they, it's not working. They're not going to work yeah. because it's a lot of interest for. No. Uh, it's very difficult to put everybody on the same page there because they're so different countries and you know. So that's that's why local is better. <laughs> yes. We need we need to stop we need to stop the rich guys the, deciding the narrative and the agenda. You know, do we need to stop this? Let's be more inclusive, everyone. Yes. You yes. know, and, and I think that another very important message that we can't leave behind is for everybody that is fluent in English, just go there and subscribe to his Jana Sunday. For all our dear Brazilians that are out there, just follow Luciana Lana. She's doing an amazing job doing this translation. And you can see that we have uh, two people that not only with amazing knowledge, but also passion for the topic, which makes things way, uh, you know, it's it's very, very something that it's, it's, it's if you read, if you're not from the field and if you read and if you follow, it's impossible not to get engaged. It's very thought provoking, a lot of interesting uh, knowledge and information and provocations that you don't usually see out there. So I strongly recommend to everyone. And thank you both so much. It's been a really great discussion, a really great debate. Uh, if I could, I would be just spending uh, when you come to Brazil, Sasha. I will, I, I will, really I hope will. that you can find some time, some time for us. It's going to be such a great time together, really, really inspiring. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, thank you Luciana, thank you, a lot. And have thank a nice, you, I don't know if it's morning or evening or in Brazil. It's morning. It's morning. morning. It's morning. Have morning. a nice <laughs> morning and nice day. It's evening in Japan, so I'm just going to go to sleep. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank Thanks, you. Luciana. Thanks. Future Hacker. Life. Path. Future.